Well, thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Um, I don't think our special guest today needs much of an introduction, but uh, I hope most of you, all of you know Sherry Blair. Sherry is a barrister and a part-time judge uh, whose focus is public law and human rights. Um, she practices in many UK courts as well as the European Court of Justice, uh, mother of four, very passionate about women's rights issues, uh, women's inequality, religious freedom, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, and also, um, is the wife of our prior prime minister for, the, uh, for 10 years. Prime minister for 10 years, not wife for 10 years. Uh, wife for no, wife longer. for 20, 29 20, years 20, on 20, Sunday. 29 no, on this, Sunday? That's Sunday. We just had our 29th wedding Fantastic. anniversary. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> how, many, how many years have you been married? 18. 18, not bad. That's not bad. Mm -hmm. no. I'll never catch up, though. You'll always be 10 years ahead. So That's um, just because I'm older than you. Though, so. <laughs> yeah. No, not perhaps as much as... Uh, as, uh, as <laughs> we won't go there. Okay. Uh, she also has a first-class degree from London School of Economics, um, which I found very fascinating. But more importantly, she's recently written a book called Speaking for Myself, which is published in May 2008. And the paperback version comes out soon. In June. In June. And a Chinese version comes out in... Also in, also in, 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 in the summer, yeah. Wonderful. And has been on the bestseller list many different places, I've noticed. So I was telling uh, Sherry earlier, I've read 17... I've never done this before. This Haven't stuff. you? You've done this at I least... I saw four videos on YouTube where you've done this. So at least you've done it four times. I know you've done it a lot more times. So um, we're going to talk about... The book, we're going to talk about uh, issues that Cherie's passionate about. And she's promised to talk about technology because she's a self proclaimed geek, so she says. <laughs> um, so, why don't we start with your book, if that's good? Um, well, actually, funny enough, when I came in here, I thought I didn't know I was going to be talking about the book on a beach. And uh, I see all you are certainly uh, as though you're on a beach. I'm, on, on, on the other hand, seem to be a bit more in a sort of uh, we, we more business. I think that'll be a lot more uncomfortable for us to but do this. But funnily enough, the book, I wanted to write a book which actually you might like to read on the beach. Um, there was a lot of publicity at the time about my book and what it was going to be about. And it was going to be some sort of political uh, diatribe. That was never what I wanted to do, and it's not what the book's about. It's actually uh, a woman's book. It's a story of, of, of a woman who's in her 50s, uh, who in a 50-year journey has come on a journey which isn't unique, though in the end she ended up at 10 Downing Street, which is obviously more unusual than, than many others. But the journey that I made over those 50 years reflects a journey that so many women have made in the developed world over the 50 years. And I talk a little bit about my mother and my grandmother, both of whom left school at 14, both of whom were, were intelligent women who had a lot to offer but didn't get the opportunities that I was offered, and um, both of whom were absolutely determined that, that I should be able, my sister should be able to take advantage of those opportunities. And I'm very conscious that that's, that's not an untypical story though it has atypical elements. And that's what I wanted to tell. And I wanted to, to see that if a girl like me, coming from working class Liverpool, can get to the White House and to meet the Pope and, and, and all the other things I've done, that any girl, or any boy, actually, uh, given the right education and the right opportunities, can go wherever they want to go. That's great. So, um I know the book describes the journey, and a lot of people here in this room, some of the best and brightest, are in the early stages of their journey of life. Um, what can you give as advice to all these people in terms of what are some of the things that they should remember as they undertake this journey, which you can draw upon from your book or your life? Well, I think for a start, never be too planned. I think you, you always need to make allowances for the unexpected. I'm a great believer in, in seizing opportunities as they come along and also trying things. Um, now, that's got me into trouble, by the way, because uh, sometimes <laughs> having, want to hear about that. Yes. <laughs> having, having an open mind and trying to try things can get you into trouble. But uh, on the other hand, curiosity about the world and, and um, what it has to offer, I think, is something that gets me up every morning, even now. Um, and what else would you say to um, 
these people aspiring to? Well, these, these people, of course, it, it, you, you were telling me, they're all already high achievers. They've already had um, opportunities which other people can, can only dream of. And the reason they're here, I think, is because they actually want to think of ways to make the sort of opportunities they've had available to everyone else, which is why I said to you I'd love to talk about technology, because I think technology is really uh, a key to, to what we can deliver in the 21st century, which we could have only dreamed about in centuries beforehand. It's not to say that there are some disadvantages of technology, but it's also a huge opportunity. So let's go to technology and we'll come back to, to we'll keep going back and forth depending on what you want to talk about. Um, you Googled yourself, I presume? <laughs> we have. <laughs> We all have. It's okay. We're amongst no, friends. Uh, no, no. Of course, of course, I've Googled myself, but it's a bit, it's a little bit sort of uh, uninformative, really, because all you get you get a whole load of stuff from the Daily Mail. You know, frankly, <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to go there. It's not, certainly not if you're me. You know, you want to go there. <laughs> um, and so, uh, uh, yes, of course, I, I use Google all the time to find things. But I'm also, of course, conscious that sometimes you find things on Google that aren't true, not least because you read the Daily Mail. That's true. Well, uh, you know, we just try and help people find the information. We can't validate, you can't the, validate the, the, information. the information. But uh, we were talking earlier upstairs about Facebook. Yeah. And you said that's a bit of a dangerous place for you to go, given how many people would be interested in finding out what you do and where you are. But your kids are on Facebook. Well, my kids are on Facebook, but from time to time they've had to come off Facebook. Uh, because the problem that they've, they've found is that they, they, they put, you know, you go into Facebook and it's like it's your environment. And that's certainly what they think. But the truth is it's also an environment that, that, that the press can get yes, into. And yes. so there have been times when we then find that pictures that my daughter may have put onto, onto Facebook have then been taken by the papers and published. And what she might have wanted to share with her community in Facebook particularly in an area when she thought she was in a private space. Mm -hmm. She doesn't actually want uh, published to her parents, frankly. And <laughs> not less, not, not the least um, to the Daily Mail. And so it, it, is a, it is a problem, I think, that if you're, if you're um, involved in public life or if you're a child of someone involved in public life, even when you're a private person yourself, that doesn't mean that other people don't think that you're uh, a non-private but do you think things can stay private on the internet at all? I mean, well, some, some of the kids who are there on Facebook could end up in public life well, five years from now. Well, it's strange, isn't it? Because I think the people, people when you use Facebook, when you use the internet, do think it's private, I think. I mean, they, they may be wrong about that, but that's what makes it kind of, you're having a conversation, you're relaxed, and, and yes, you think you're you're sharing it with your whoever it is you were talk, we were talking about community <laughs> self-selecting. So you think you're sharing it with a community of like-minded people, but of course there's always a, the, the opportunity for you to be sharing it with people actually you don't want to be sharing it with. So that, that's one of the challenges of technology as well as one of the opportunities. Yeah. It brings all sorts of different people together, but it also raises issues uh, about what are the consequences of that. It's not least again talking about me putting up a, up a site and wanting to do that, uh, uh, but being very conscious, of course, because uh, I want to ha I want to have a site. I want to help women get in contact with other women. I always remember I was doing a speech in Ru in Russia, and uh, I often do uh, PowerPoint presentations of my speeches, and I wanted some pictures of Russian women. So I went into Google and I put in. Russian women. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, I was at the time I was still in number ten, and suddenly these. I thought this is not what I was thinking. <laughs> this is not the sort of Russian women I was thinking of. And so you, you okay. and I also thought at any moment now the Downing Street sort of um, the, the security security people yeah, are yes. going to come rushing in here and seize the computer and uh, have me disciplined for bad bad behavior and so you you have to be you have to be pretty careful don't you so i was having the same conversation with somebody who has a 17 year old about being on facebook and he was trying to tell his daughter that you know be careful whatever you put there yeah. could show up in public life yeah. at some point in time and she took her dad for a walk and explained that dad this is a generational gap thing that most likely the person who's going to be interviewing you me will also be on facebook 
So what do you think is just old people like you and me who are worried about disinformation and the new generation really is going to be different? In well, the way you do I think it goes back to what I said. I think that they're perfectly happy because she'd be perfectly happy if the person who's interviewing her is presumably her age and someone because yeah. they're in that community. But, you know, would she be so happy? I mean, I know your daughter is a bit younger than this yet, but would this 17-year-old girl be so happy if, in fact, what they were saying on Facebook was actually on, their fa on her father's newspaper the next day with banner headlines saying, you know, business executive's daughter or whatever? Um, and and that, that's, that's the question. That's, isn't it? that's probably not a good idea. So, so I don't think that's about old and young. I think it's about uh, not always appreciating the, the, the pitfalls. So, so you talked about you know, your kids having to be taken off Facebook and your uh, being on Facebook not being a good no, idea. No, no, you're persuading me that maybe I should, or was it, was it, was it Facebook or YouTube? Anyway? I think YouTube. Yeah. I think you should definitely think, have a yeah. channel on YouTube. What do you guys think? I think she needs to have a channel on YouTube. Uh, but we'll talk yeah, well, about that. I say, as I told you, I'm always liking to try things, and it's yes. always getting me into trouble. So when I get into trouble, I'm going to call you and Sounds blame like you. So we're trying to find her a camera slightly smaller than that that she can take with her when she goes, uh, goes to people. So we'll get you on a YouTube channel. But you touched upon something, which is the notion of public life and having your kids having to grow up in the media spotlight. And pretty much you haven't spent a lot of your life now in the media spotlight. How, is, how does that impact life, and how is that different? Well, I think one of the things I wanted to do again in the book was to try and give... Uh, my husband's going to write, but he's writing a book, and it will come out soon, and that's going to be all about the politics. Which one's going to be better? Well, it depends what you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's not, going to, he's not going to talk about some of the things that I talked about, and indeed, when he read the book, I think he was skipped over quite a few of the things, in, in, uh, overwhelmed with embarrassment. Um, but I wanted to try and convey something about what it is like to live, or to try and live a private life in very public circumstances. And yet, in some ways, uh, it's a bit of the story of my life, because um, when I was a girl, um, my father was, a, was very famous for his time, because he was uh, an actor, and he, be he was very fortunate that he became um, the sort of young interest in what was one of the very first comedy soap operas uh, in, in the 1960s called To Death Do Us Part, and uh, my father literally played himself, really, which was the Skousgit son-in-law of uh, Warren Mitchell, who was the uh, working class, uh, racist, East End, opinionated uh, person in, in the family, and this was very much cutting edge at the time, and so I suddenly found myself uh, at school being uh, the child of somebody very famous. Uh, then, of course, I ended up married to somebody very famous, and I still think, as I said before, that one day I'll probably be the mother of somebody very, very famous. Um, so it's, it's an interesting question about how public life and, 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 and private life coincide. And when we went into to number 10, my first priority was to ensure that my kids, um, that whatever else I did, was that I preserved a private space for my children. And, and a lot of the time we were in number 10, it, it, there was quite a struggle to try and make that, <coughs> that happen. Because the other thing I wanted to do, and because my father was famous, but my father abandoned my mother and my sister and I, was his mother in Liverpool and went off um, uh, to pursue his career in London. So though he was famous, he wasn't at home. And so I was always at, at, at one stake removed. I was also very concerned that my children should feel that whatever happened when we were in number 10 wasn't something that had been imposed on them, but that they, they were very much a part of it. And there's a bit of tension there, really, between making sure that your, your family is involved and feel involved, and at the same time protecting them from the press who say, well, if you allow your child to be photographed at all, it means that we can then follow them around and do anything we like about it. Now, as a lawyer, I happen to know that that's not how privacy law works. Um, but sometimes uh, there's obviously always a constant tension between the press who always want more and, and the personal who always wants to preserve a private space. So what do you think about the UK media? Oh, I love them. 
they are um, uh, and <laughs> we, we are on camera so yes. we, what you have to understand is that you know a free media is a really really important part of, of, of democracy I totally and utterly accept that but I think there's a difference between the public interest as we would define it which is things that the public are legitimately interested and entitled to know about and things that the public might be interested in, which may, of course, and in fact we know, of course, is often uh, uh, stuff which is more about gossip and celebrity yeah. and, and lifestyle, which wouldn't necessarily be embraced by the noble cause of ensuring that democracy functions well, but because that you have a, a challenging and connected media. So um, let's go back and try and bridge media and technology because all of us here constantly sort of face this conversation with media given that things are moving to the internet and there's a lot of sort of you know, conversation about newspapers being in trouble. Well, it, it's true. And you know, as a politician, you have to engage with the media because democracy is all about the people uh, holding their elected officials accountable and therefore they need to know what their elected officials are doing, and the elected officials who have a, have a program for government also want to actually explain what's going on, and that's why the media is very, very important. On the other hand, if it gets hijacked into trivia, which is why the, <coughs> the problem that I sometimes encountered, you know, when, when the government had a serious issue, if all that was being talked about was Cherie's latest gaffe, then actually I was damaging something that I cared very deeply about, which was that the new Labour government would be a success and would deliver. And so, you know, you're, you're, so you're constantly um, in danger of being sidetracked yes. from your, your, your mission. Now, for the newspapers, are we going to need newspapers? I'm sure we're going to need, we were just talking before, you have all this information in the, on the internet and you do need some sort of way of filtering that information. And that's basically what journalists have done uh, yes. through the centuries, is help filter the information. So content, journalistic content, I think is very important. How it's delivered, on the other hand, is a slightly different question, isn't it? Because though I st still get my newspaper and like to read it, um, <coughs> particularly when I'm traveling, actually, I will probably go onto the internet and, and get that, that, that information. And I know my kids, of course, get so much of their information through, through the new media. And that's, that's definitely a generational thing and a, a real challenge for, mm -hmm. for the more traditional media. So, so shifting to another Google service, uh, you mentioned that you've hooked up your house on Google Street View, <laughs> have you not? I have indeed. Uh, but, but one of your houses is not on Google Earth, and the other one is. Well, we have a little place in the country, and that's kind of, um, I think because it's in the country, you know, as far as I gather, your coverage doesn't cover everything yet. But obviously, our house in, um, in London is very much on the, um, on, on the, the Google. It, it's very, actually, I was looking for something. Nice, sunny, something. bright day when you're taking the picture. Yes, it's a, rather nice, it's a rather nice picture. And you, know, you, go onto, you go onto the Google Maps, so you get your directions, and then you now can click on that little button, and yeah. you can actually, yeah. oh, yeah. Fantastic. I was, yeah. Now, I was one, fascinated. <laughs> one of the things we talked about was this balance that one has to strike between the role of technology and privacy for an individual. Mm -hmm. For instance, you're a lawyer, you talk about human rights, and you talk about these things. How do you think we strike that balance right? And what should we be thinking about? Well, you know, I think, and, and that there's never a 100% right answer about this. And the more you talk about human rights, you have to understand it's always about balance. Um, there are very few absolutes in human rights. Uh, in fact, even the right to life for a long time uh, was qualified by capital punishment. Now, in Europe now, we don't uh, quite do that quali qualification anymore, and you can't be a member of the Council of Europe if you have the death penalty. But the fact was, even that most fundamental right to life did have a, a proviso. Uh, you also torture and slavery are some of the absolute rights. But when you start talking about privacy, the right to family life, uh, when you talk about uh, the rights of association, free speech, all of them come with a, uh, with a requirement that you can only do that so long as you don't interfere with the rights and freedoms of others. And all of them actually come 
with this notion of responsibility and you know you can't it, it's human rights are much more um, nuanced than that and then of course there isn't a, a hierarchy of rights so your right to um, disseminate information comes up against my right to privacy and that's about trying to strike a balance and generally speaking the rule is what you do is you do the least intrusive way of restricting freedom which is commensurate with giving rights and freedoms to others and that involves governments <coughs> trying to strike a balance which will go involves individuals and companies mm -hmm. trying to strike a balance and in the end if the balance uh, if they can't agree on where the balance is it involves the courts adjudicating mm -hmm. as to where the balance should be struck the advantage i would say this as a lawyer about having it decided in the courts is that you do in the court of course have a debate and the two sides of the argument are put and in the end the judge has to reach a conclusion and when he reaches that conclusion he gives you his why do i say he she gives you <laughs> her reasons yes. and uh, so you have a reason judgment and if you don't like it then you can you can then appeal so as someone who believes in the rule of law i think that's a good uh, structure for trying to reach this balance but everybody has a part to play in that we were talking earlier about dna information for example yeah. and how if we had access to a lot of dna information around the world there's a possibility we could do a lot for health yeah it's very um, uh, definitely very much so and the risk is now if you collect everybody's dna information that sort of borders on your notion of intrusion into people's well you see privacy. actually I, I i think that uh if it was happened to everybody if everybody had their DNA collected, then everybody would in the, be in the same boat. I think the, the concern has been, and of course there's been a recent case about that, is that it wasn't happening to everybody, but it was only happening to certain uh, people, and they were people who, would, one way or another, had come into yeah. connection with the police. And um, it was agreed, and, and doing this balancing act, that if someone is actually committed for a crime and has been convicted, then clearly that is right that their dna should mm. be collected and kept the question is however if they are not charged with a crime or if they're acquitted then what happens and the european court has decided that across europe uh, there are restrictions on that and we've had an unrestricted access and they decided that they felt that that wasn't um, the right balance but actually i mean i think there could be a case for everybody contributing their DNA because we do know that the bigger the, the, you know we had a bigger DNA database than many other places in Europe and because of that we you have been able to identify people who've committed serious crimes and it doesn't seem like a day doesn't go past or certainly a week doesn't go past when some DNA evidence has either solved a crime today or as we saw just recently has proved somebody innocent uh, years after the event mm. so DNA is a very important tool but it has to be the way you use that tool has to be done so that there are checks and balances and so there's a balance between people's rights and the rights of the community to protect itself and uh, you know this is a this is a debate that it's absolutely right that we should have so it's a good thing we're taking pictures of everybody's house yeah. almost everybody well I, so I, doing I, it to everybody is the same way like you suggest it, you know, in some ways, if everybody's in the same boat, then you can see that, that that's a, a good argument. I also, because I sit as a judge and I see in cases in court, we have quite often we have um, uh, tele uh, camera evidence, video camera evidence, and it get, seems to get better all the time. And, uh, but often, of course, you find that when it comes to the actual crucial moment, that's just the bit you can't see. <laughs> um, so let's really change depends. topics. Let's, you know, we, you're, you're very passionate about women's mm -hmm. uh, equality issues, and you were, were talking about Kenya, Rwanda, and other parts of the world. Can you just give us a sense of you know, all the things you see in that area? What do you think uh, are important things? You had a very interesting point about making sure we are designing technology which is sort of gender neutral. Accessible to women, yeah. Yeah, so we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, basically, it all comes back to my, my life story. You know, I was, I was a, a girl brought up by two strong women who didn't have opportunities uh, that I was given. And, and 
you go across the world and you see so many wasted opportunities because in so many cultures and in so many societies, women just aren't valued in the same way as men. You know, we still have a world today when a girl baby is born in India or in China, or maybe, maybe not even born, because they know it's a girl baby and so it's aborted simply because of that, or is born but then infanticized. There are plenty of places around the world where you have a baby and it's a boy and it's of course for celebration, and you have a baby and it's a girl and it's, you know, well, at best, better luck next time. As long as we start from that position where women are not valued the same as men, then we are not actually uh, having the world as it ought to be, where women and men mm -hmm. are of equal worth and of equal value and come together and work as partners, which is much more creative. I, mean, I can see here you've got men, well, men, and, men and women, and the reality is it's much more creative when we use our complementary skills. But you know, it goes on. You go to school. Girls, 70% of the illiterate children in the world are girls. Why is that? Because when it comes to making choices about which child you educate, boys are more likely to be educated than girls. And yet we know that if you do educate a girl child, you have, uh, your, she's more likely to have fewer children, she's more likely to marry later, she's more likely to make sure her children are inoculated, she's more likely to educate her own children. So you couldn't have a better investment, but many, many countries were failing there. And then you go on, girls get married too young, uh, therefore they lose out on education, or the women here uh, will know, even if not in this company, and we could talk about that, but, but even if it's not in this company, in other companies they've been, you know, we find that girls leave, leave university now probably doing better at university than men, that within three years of women graduating, they are already earning 15% less than the equivalent male graduate. Why is that? Uh, we could talk about that. And I, I could go on. So I think the women's issues, you know, in the 21st century, if the 21st century is not the century when women become equally respected and of equal value with men, then we will have failed. And that's my, my passion. Uh, we need to make sure that those opportunities are there. So then I think, well, what can I do to do with that? I've touched on education being a key, uh, but lots of things are going on about education at the moment, really good work. But the thing that struck me about my own story in comparison is that it was the fact that I was able to be economically independent, to get and to keep my own money and make my own choices about that that made a big difference. And so I'm very interested in how we give this economic independence to women. And what I want to try and do is to help women uh, entrepreneurs, to help them link up with other women and um, grow their businesses. Now by that I don't mean microfinance. I'm sure everyone in this room knows microfinance is a fantastic success story. Not designed originally for women, now very much about women. But it's still about helping mothers educate. It's still about keeping women within mm -hmm. the confines that society has put to them. It's very, very hard. Not all of those women will be entrepreneurs, but it's very hard for those women who come up through microfinance, who are entrepreneurs, to gain access to the next stage of growing your business. So I'm concentrating on helping with training programs and mentoring and networking advice for that grade of women who can then break out of the homes and become drivers of development in, in their country. And for that, I'm sure there's a lot we can do with IT. So let's, let's focus on Africa because, you know, as, I, as you mentioned earlier, there's a lot of stuff that Google is doing in Africa, yeah. wants to do in Africa on the infrastructure side. And you touched upon Rwanda and, and the situation there. Well, I was telling you, would you like me to tell yeah, you the story? In fact, I describe in, in the book, because I, I go to Rwanda, I went first with Laura Bush, um, just after the G8 uh, summit. Uh, I've been fascinated for, about Rwanda for a long time because, of course, Rwanda had the genocide and it also had an international tribunal that dealt with the crimes against humanity there. And as a lawyer, I was, I was very interested in how, how, was, how, how, as a legal system, do you cope when society collapses to such an extent that people who were neighbors 
start doing the most mm -hmm. unspeakably horrible things to each other. So I, I went to Rwanda and then I went a, a second time and in my second time they took me up to a village in the north of the country which had been ravaged by the genocide and had been sort of left for dead. And then an American entrepreneur had come and had helped them set up a cooperative and they were doing fair trade coffee. And in fact, their coffee was being sold in Sainsbury's here. And um, the women were very much involved in that project. In particular, they trained the women to do, I don't know if, I didn't realize this, but you know, like you do wine tasting, you do the same thing with coffee beans. In fact, they tried, I tried to do it, but I was hopeless because you have to swill it around your mouth and spit it out. I just couldn't, I couldn't get my head around it. But these women were fantastic and they were some of the best uh, testers and graders of, of, of coffee. And I was talking to them and they were telling me about how they were using the internet to contact their suppliers because then they would know what the price of coffee was going to be and they could also deal with um, queries mm -hmm. and, and requests. And they took me to uh, their office where they had a computer and they were doing all this on Skype. Here I am in the middle of nowhere in Rwanda, and here they were communicating with Sainsbury's in London and people in America using Skype. And when they weren't using the computer for their business, the women had made it available to the uh, school in the village so the kids could use it for their projects. And I thought, you know, isn't this amazing? That could not have happened. 10, 15 years ago, but it just shows the power of, of technology. But one of the things I've subsequently learned, however, is that technology in Africa is becoming available, but it's very man-centered. The people who are going in there, when they talk about, you know, you can, you, can, you can use this for banking, you can use this for insurance, you can use this for communicating with your markets, in their heads, they see a man doing all those things. And if, you talk, if they talk about and think about women using it at all, what they'll say is, oh, well, for the women, of course, it means they can speak to their mother or their friends, you know, more often uh, during the day. Um, and so you, it's really important that if we're talking about access to technology in Africa, that we make it so that it isn't gender-centric, that, it, that it, it, it isn't masculine, that, it, that it, it's actually seen as something that's available to women as well as men. Otherwise, we'll have the same problem that you have about women getting access to finance, we have the same ac problem for women yeah. having access to technology, which is a really important tool to develop your business. So in that context, uh, another thing which is, I think, very common amongst the people here, not only they're all smart uh, and they work for Google, is all of them, I think, I speak for everyone, have a passion to try and change the world. Mm. Well, me and, too. <laughs> and the question is, what advice can you give them in terms of them individually making a contribution towards changing the world? Well, I absolutely think it does start with the individual. I think there's lots of things we can do more, more generally, but in the end, it's about you and your view of the world and your belief in yourself and the fact that you can make a difference. And if we can teach our children, if we can bring everybody up to see that actually each one of us can make a difference. And we can do that in all sorts of ways, even in simple things like buying the Rwandan coffee. Uh, I've just been involved in, in, in a campaign about um, trafficking in women and children across the world. And uh, Cadbury's have just announced that from uh, the summer, their Cadbury's dairy milk is going to be a fair trade product. Because I don't know if, if you know, but actually there's a big problem in West Africa where a lot of the cocoa beans come from with children and others being trafficked into there. Not, not for sex, but as, as workers in collecting the cocoa, for which they don't get paid, they, 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 they're, they're just trapped there. And there are now ways of ensuring that you only buy cocoa beans from places where that's not happening. So taking decisions like that about your Easter eggs that some of you may be thinking of, of buying would, would, would be something you can do. But with the skills and knowledge in, 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 in this room, there is so much you can do, so much you can do nationally, and I'm sure you probably have schemes already where you link yeah, up with schools yeah. and you do mentoring and, and, and help there. And then, of course, internationally, just with what you're saying, I know you're thinking about Africa at the moment, so think about some of these things. Think about the women in Africa as, as well as the men. Uh, think about how much they have to, to offer. 
So in that line, in, you know, you have all this energy and all this all this passion. Where do you draw your inspiration from? From a, from, a, from a number of things. I think it, uh, at the end it does go back to my mother and my grandmother um, and, and seeing them struggle. Um, when, when my father left, my mother, who had been, she'd been accepted at RADA and so she'd gone to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in, in, in the 50s and then she'd, she'd gone in her vacation, she got the vacation job and that's how she met my father. They were, he was the juvenile lead and male, and she was a juvenile female lead. The next thing you know, she's pregnant with me. And, and then several years on, her husband leaves her, and she actually goes and works in a fish and chip shop in the docks in, uh, in, in Seaforth. To, it was the only job she could find where she could be able to be there for us during the day and still work at night. And you think the come down from thinking you're going to be glamorous actress to working in a fish and chip shop in, 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 in the docks of, of Liverpool. And yet she then, you know, pulled herself up, got herself a better job, educated two daughters, both of whom qualified as, as, as lawyers, and ended up as the, the mother of law of the Prime Minister. <laughs> She's had an incredible life. Um, so one of the things which we all struggle with, uh, which we find as we talk to people, is since everybody is ambitious, everybody has tremendous amounts of energy and passion uh, in this room, um, we often struggle with striking the right balance between work and life. And you're a mother of four, you have a professional career, uh, you have a, a very public life, as well as uh, you were married to an individual who also has a very public yeah. life. And how do you balance all these things so that you can maintain your relationships and it's, it, Keep the it personal is, part happy. I would say do as I say, but not necessarily as I do, <laughs> um, because I, that's what I'm, I'm going to Malta tomorrow to, to, to talk uh, at, a, at a breakfast meeting there with the wife of the Prime Minister of Malta, precisely about these work-life issues. And I wish I had the magic formula, because if I had, uh, wouldn't I be a wealthy woman? But one thing I'm sure of is that this is not just about women. This is absolutely about men and women together. And if we see this, if we see work-life balance issues as simply a woman's issue, we are completely missing the point. Because if it's wrong to think as, of, of women as simply only being able to offer things within the confines of the home, it's equally wrong to think that men actually are only there to be the breadwinners and that they, they don't care about their family life, that they don't have a lot to offer. It's very important, for example, that our boys and our girls see images of men, you know, good men, of active fathers who, who are contributing not just in the workforce but in their, in their family life. And of course, work-life balance isn't just about bringing up children. It's about what you do about your elderly parents, something that's becoming more of a live issue for me is, uh, and, and, and for many people. Uh, and it's also about just doing the things that you're passionate about. I mean, one of the problems I find is just finding some time when actually you're doing something for yourself. And many of you in, in this room might sometimes find that, particularly some of you who are parents, that uh, you know, by the time you, one young woman lawyer said to me that you know, if only my uh, the partners in this firm could understand the amount sheer amount of effort that I've put into getting all my kids out at school and everything sorted out before I come into work, they would never doubt the commitment that I had to to my work. But in the midst of all that, sometimes you can lose out on actually making sure that you're still a, a, a person who's got needs and, 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 and rounded experiences. So it's a really difficult question, but it's not just about uh, crashes at work, that, that, that helps. It's not just about making sure you have flexi work, mm -hmm. which certainly as an IT company, I presume it's, it goes without <laughs> saying. I mean, I couldn't have done my career. I couldn't have carried on as a lawyer if it wasn't for the fact that I was able to use the internet and the intranet from Ken Downing Street so I could actually carry on researching my cases without having to uh, actually physically go into the, into the office. Uh, but it's not only uh, about, about that. It, 
it, it's also about an attitude of, of mind. It's about accepting that people sometimes may want to come into the workforce. So it may well be in your 20s you work very, very hard. But maybe in your sort of childbearing years, you might want to take a bit more work, a bit more flexibly. Mm -hmm. But if you do that, it's really important that there's a way of getting back into the mm -hmm. workforce. It's very important that you keep connections, that you keep your, your training uh, going. Um, I myself, when I was a, a young barrister, in those days, there wasn't, um, we didn't have a maternity policy. And I thought at the time, I was so determined, uh, being the first woman um, in my chambers, uh, I was so determined to show that I could have children and still, you know, still be a good barrister. And looking back on it now, I think that, you know, maybe I thought I was changing the system, but maybe I was just uh, playing to the system Adapt, yeah. because I wasn't, I, you know, there was there was no concession made for the fact you're pregnant, and actually we need to make some concessions. Society needs to make concessions for the fact that pregnant women uh, need to, uh, you know, be essentially protected so that their babies uh, flourish. I mean, eventually, in, in my first son, they actually confined me to the hospital bed be, you know, 10 days before he was, well, actually, I think a month before he was due because he wasn't growing enough. Now, in fact, it turned out afterwards that all my babies were small, so actually it probably was the, the right thing for me, but it, it, it was kind of, I was so busy doing all these things that maybe I wasn't looking after myself well enough, and we, don't, we shouldn't put women in that position. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to ask people to think of questions and ask the questions which are on their mind. But before we do that, you can't come to Google and not answer the question we ask every new Googler. Oh my God. So you're going to have to help me. So should we start with the first concert? Your first concert. My first concert? Yeah. You, that, that, that I performed in or that I attended? <laughs> Both. <laughs> <laughs> Both. <laughs> I know Tony used to sing in a band. Oh, absolutely. But I also... Um, um, in, in, in the 60s, there was a big thing about folk music, and, you know, and uh, Joni Mitchell and Joan Baez. I've met Joan Baez recently. I know he died. You know, I said, oh, my God, I used to sing your songs. I used to play a guitar and uh, sing. I thought, well, but probably very, very badly. <laughs> so that, 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 that's for sure. Um, so that was the first... Concert that you performed That in. I performed in. And my first concert that I attended, that's quite... Difficult. I remember. I mean, I remember going quite early on to see Elton John perform. Later on, of course, he was at that first time he went to the White House, and we had uh, we had the, the, with the Clintons, and the, we had a state visit, and they they put on a fantastic concert that Elton John played in, and Stevie Wonder sang "My Sherry Amour" for me, which was yes, you know yes, pretty good, yeah. pretty good. One of the highlights. <laughs> what are the other questions that we ask Googlers? But before we uh, go ahead, Leanne. Okay. Uh, what are the other Googler questions? First date? First date. Do you want to answer that? <laughs> yeah. Random, <laughs> Random fact. fact. Well, I'll do first date. Well, well, why do you do the first date? I already, I already t seen you talk about your boyfriends in your interview with the Dominican University of California, so I think it's out in the public uh, domain. Well, there is. Okay. So there was more than one. I had, surprisingly, though my husband doesn't like me to talk about it, there were a few more boyfriends before him. Um, that, that, that's true. But actually, the, 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 the the, the first date, or the first time I was kissed, was when I was about seven, and... Um, <laughs> okay, I don't think you were saying <laughs> the right role model here. You got to <laughs> with, with, a, with, a, with a boy who was, who's, who's, uh, whose father actually became... Well, he was the choir master at, at school, because I was sing, singing in the choir, and it was under the... In those days, we still had steam trains traveling between Liverpool and Southport, and the, the, uh, it was under one of the bridges that went over the, um, the train, and then my sister ran back and told my mum about it. <laughs> Very embarrassing. Because years later, having, having told this story, the Daily Mail then, of course, go and track down this ready <laughs> <laughs> No, no, this very nice chap who now, who now, runs, now runs a pub in um, uh, somewhere in, 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 in England. So. Uh, and he, he insisted that we were not seven and that we were older than that. So I am sure. He insisted you were, he was legal age. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I think he insisted we were about nine or ten, but he was wrong. <laughs> okay, well, on that, Leanne, uh, do you have a question? Yeah, I have. Um, well, there's, it's cheeky because it's two questions. Firstly, why did you join the Labour Party? And secondly, why didn't you ever stand for Parliament? Well, I did stand for Parliament. 
Uh, um, so, so I stand corrected. <laughs> I joined the Labour Party because, well, partly um, it's kind of, uh, I came from a working class family and, and we, we always voted Labour. And when I was, when I was 16, we had a, a teacher at school, Mrs. Fate, who actually, because I was at a convent school, but she was a Quaker and she was a member of, of, of the Labour Party and, and she invited me along to meetings and years later, um, she contacted me when I was in number 10 and subsequent she's, she died and you know, I still keep in contact with her daughter who every year sends me a little note. So she was the first person who enjoyed me. And I joined the Labour Party because I believe in social justice, in equality, and it's, its mission to make people like me have the opportunities that I've been able to have. If it hadn't have been for the Labour government coming in in 1945 and changing the system, you know, a girl like me wouldn't have even got the opportunity to go to, to, to school. I am so fortunate because I had a full grant to go to university. Um, which was, uh, which was a fantastic opportunity. Um, you know, so I think I need to, uh, to give them something back, and part of the way of giving something back was to support the Labour Party, and I did stand for Parliament. And in 1983, I stood in Tanat North, which was a, a seat which is basically around Margate and Herne Bay, which even in 97 didn't become a Labour seat. So it was never, never a surefire winner, that's for sure. But there was a brief period when Tony was the candidate's spouse. Um, <laughs> this was not a happy period for him. <laughs> um, and I tell the story in the book of how just in Easter, just before the, the May uh, election, or was it in June, actually, I think, probably, um, we'd been on holiday, and then we came back from holiday in, in France into um, Dover, and we went to see my agent to talk about the forthcoming election. And so we had lunch. And at the end of lunch, he said to Tony, Tony, would you mind, but Sheree and I need to talk a bit about the campaign and business, so would you mind going out and helping my wife wash up? <laughs> and so he went and helped his her wife wash up. And as he was drying the pots, uh, she said to him, Tony, are you interested in politics at all, or is it just that you're doing this to support Sheree? I think at that point, he was about to divorce me. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think... Uh, what Hillary Clinton shows is that it's not easy, actually, to be the spouse of, of, of a leader. Um, and um, I think she showed that she was a fantastic first lady and also had the potential to be a fantastic president and now a fantastic secretary of state. But I think Bill possibly, who was a great leader, could have done with a little bit more help about being a, a, a you know, running that first lady role. It's, uh, it's more difficult than you think. I think you need a mic. Oh, just stand up and. Get your view specifically on recent calls about cutting maternity leave from nine months to six months to allow uh, fathers more time off work to be with their well, newborn. I actually think this is a really uh, interesting idea and one which illustrates something I do feel passionately about, which is about we should be talking about parenting in the 21st century and we should not be assuming that um, this is all about women. Uh, and I, fa I think sometimes as women, we need to be careful. You, you, you can often find that if you go to the school gate, you know, if, if you go as a mother, that's fine. You know, but a father going to the school gate, you know, and half the mothers are wondering whether he's a child molester. I mean, we, we, need, to, you know, we need to start um, being more comfortable about the idea that you know, men too uh, have a lot to offer. In, in a caring role, and, and um, that's a challenge for women because, for, in a sense, I suppose, for a long time we've been placed in this area, and now it's about sharing this area. Ha having, um, having said that, uh, I think I also have said that we obviously need to do some things to support a woman when she goes through what is it essentially a physical process of pregnancy, and you do need to make allowances for that, um, because otherwise, uh, you know, you can endanger both the mother and the child. So, so there needs to there needs to be a balance there, but shared parenting, shared responsibility is the way ahead. And actually, I was very lucky 
the, the ironic thing is that if Tony and I had both been barristers, uh, because he was doing more commercial law and I was doing more of the um, employment law, which doesn't get paid as, as much, uh, if I'd have fallen pregnant and he was still a, a lawyer, it may well have been that, that it would have been actually harder for me to continue with my work. But the fact was that as I was fighting that election in 1983, he went off and got the Sedgefield seat, which was a safe seat. And I discovered I, I, I didn't... I thought I was just in distress, but it turned out that I was actually pregnant with my first child at that point. Um, but because Tony had then become an MP, I also found myself then being the main breadwinner. And so to that extent, there was a financial incentive for me to carry on working. And Tony, because he was an opposition MP and therefore wasn't in, in government, had actually um, slightly more time to be a hands-on father. And he was, you know, they, he always joked, rather he very unkindly shares with, with many people, that I am, once I get to sleep at night, you know, you kind of have to dynamite me out of bed. And so um, often at night time when, when, the, when the children were crying, it would be Tony who would, he would get up and then he'd bring the baby to me and, you know, I would then feed the, feed the baby. And, you know, he was, he was definitely changing nappies long before it was fashionable. Of course, it became more difficult when Leo came along because then he's suddenly prime minister. And, uh, you know, I was, I was, I was having a, wanting to persuade him to take his maternity leave. And, of course, Leo did very well because he was actually born early on a Friday at a week which actually was a parliamentary recess week. And so there was no, there was no, uh, there was no um, question time. And so Tony was able, he didn't take, obviously, kept taking phone calls and he worked on his boxes, but he did base himself up in, in the flat for, for, for that week. And the fact was, as soon as Leo was born, he wanted to be there. As those of you who are fathers will know that feeling, I'm sure, and those of you who will become fathers will experience it too. You want to be able to, to share in this new life which the two of you have created together. And that's really important. Well, I think there's the, the, the two points there. One is the issue of, of corruption and what in the speak we call governance issues. And it's actually something that, that Tony feels very passionately about as well. And in fact, he has, as part of his like, work that he's doing now, uh, um, a, a charity. And at the moment, they're working both in Rwanda and in Sierra Leone. And their main purpose is to try and help uh, with setting up and supporting uh, uh, proper system of governance, which is particularly helping in both cases to run the office of the president and the prime minister in the countries in a way which is transparent, which is open, uh, corruption-free, and efficient. Efficient actually is really quite important, as you can imagine. Uh, I myself am interested in how we can use the law to help with that, uh, because in many of these countries, like Rwanda, for example, there were, after the genocide, there were only about 15 lawyers in the entire country. I mean, that's a, a real challenge to try and build up uh, a, a legal system uh, from, from scratch. The other thing I'm convinced of is that once you get corruption in the system, it's very, very damaging. And it's, 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 it's a very precious thing, a corrupt free um, bureaucracy, a corrupt free judiciary. And once you have that undermined, it takes a long time to put it right. So it's a really, it's, 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 it's a really important issue. Um, and it's quite a complicated and difficult uh, subject to, to tackle. As for what, what we do about development, well, I think one thing we've, we've certainly learned, and if you listen to someone like Mohammed Yunus, he, he would tell you this as well, um, that, that handouts are not as good as hand-ups. Um, imposing things on people without consulting them doesn't work. 
So if you're going to go mm -hmm. in, what you must do is you must consult the local community, you must make sure the local community have a sense of ownership in it, if you're possible, involve the local community in the, in, 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 if, if you're talking mm -hmm. about digging a well or laying a, a road, you know, so that the jobs actually go to the local people. It's also about, even at a higher level, when you're going in, uh, lots of countries have lots of consultants. It's really important that the consultants actually transfer the knowledge and leave it in the country, rather than having the knowledge, going in, doing a project, and then taking the knowledge out again. So it's all about capacity building. It's all about helping people, whether it's a government mm -hmm. or actually individuals, help themselves, because there's a dignity in that, and there's a learning experience in that, which um, sometimes aid projects haven't always encouraged. Thanks. Uh, we touched on Street View earlier, and um, as you know, some parties uh, in this country have reacted quite strongly against Street View, even going so far as to ask for it to be shut down. Um, and some have pointed out the irony that uh, we live in a country where the public accepts, um, with little protest, uh, a government who collects vast amounts of data, um, recently talking about tracking social networks and emails and text messages in the name of uh, national security. Um, what are your views on that? Should we be more worried about the government, less worried about freeing the information to the public? Well, I think it's what I, what I said before about the whole question about privacy and rights to information. It's about getting the balance right. Uh, and you know, when, you, when you have any of these issues, I think you have to say, well, what, 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 is, what are we collecting this information for? Is it for a good purpose? Because if it isn't, <laughs> then we shouldn't be doing it anyway. That's the first thing. But let's assume, therefore, that there is a legitimate purpose in that. Are we, so the next question then is, are we doing it in the least intrusive way? Uh, and that may involve, for example, as I gather you now, you now do, allowing people, if they do object, to opt out. Uh, or it may involve actually saying you have to have people opt in. I mean, these are, these, these are, these are the questions that need to be debated. Uh, law, lawyers love the concept of proportionality. Is it proportional? So it's that it's the idea you don't use a sledgehammer to crack a nut. And actually, it's all about a scale and a balance. And it, it's about bringing the, the balance to the right tipping point. And that may change over time. And, and it, it, it's about debating. It's about being transparent in what you're doing. Uh, and it's about making sure that you can justify what you're doing as actually benefiting people. Because if you can't, then you shouldn't be doing it. But we prefer we prefer the idea of opt out as opposed to opt in because but you it would. becomes it becomes very onerous. And it, hey, even in my building planning permission, you have a choice to object as opposed to. But but you but you would. But the, there needs to be a discussion about whether because uh, because you you have also a commercial imperative, and so you know, is your commercial imperative furthering or not furthering the public interest and. The, the, the important thing is to debate that and to debate it openly. Uh, but I think the disadvantages, and somehow, sometimes I don't like some of the, the things that are in the press, is, that, is this kind of scaremongering about things. Um, because actually sharing information, um, having information available, is a very powerful tool for good as well as for bad. And therefore we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't be silly about this. Mm -hmm but we have to make sure that there are, there are the proper checks and balances in place. Hi, uh, you and I are both uh, Catholics, I believe. Um, oh, yes. How does it make you feel when you see Cardinal Ratzinger, or uh, Pope uh, Benedict, Pope rather, Benedict, yes. um, going to Africa, to com many countries which have double-digit HIV infection rates, uh, telling people not to use condoms? Um, and what do, you, what do you think that uh, Catholics should actually do about that? Um, I think it makes me... Uh, rather sad uh, and I think that uh, there is a, a real question uh, and a real dividing line between uh, contraception which I see as a way of preventing life beginning and abortion which is about terminating a life that has begun and I think there is a distinction between
between the two and that sometimes the condom issue uh, doesn't add clarity to that distinction but rather um, makes it a lot a lot more muddy. Uh, my own view is, and I, I've said this before, that condoms are absolutely essential in the fight against AIDS and that we should be encouraging people to use them. But we also understand that promiscuity is a problem, that actually sex is about uh, relationships and respect, and that, uh, that if you have a culture which sees sex as just a commodity, if we, uh, that, that, that this, this is not necessarily, this is, well, this is not, not necessarily a bad thing, it is a bad thing. And therefore, how, how we uh, encourage people to behave responsibly and part of behaving responsibly, to, to my mind, in, in, in particularly in a country where there's an endemic AIDS epidemic, is to use safe sex methods. But responsible sex is also really important, and the idea that uh, anything goes, and, and, and the Pope, of course, was talking about how promiscuity is a problem, and it, it is a problem, and he's right to draw attention to that. Again, we're talking about striking the right balance having a discussion and, and making sure uh, that we don't throw the sort of dignity baby out with the, uh, the bathwater. The dignity of individuals and the respect there should be between a man and a woman uh, in all relationships, including the sexual one. And actually, for that matter, uh, between uh, same-sex partners. Thank you very much for coming